the practice of cessation. Should there be a person who desires to practice cessation, he should stay in a quiet place and sit erect in an even temper. His attention should be focused neither on breathing nor on any form or color, nor on empty space, earth, water, fire, wind, nor even on what has been seen, heard, remembered, or conceived. All thoughts, as soon as they are conjured up, are to be discarded, and even the thought of discarding them is to be put away. For all things are essentially in the state of transcending thoughts, and are not to be created from moment to moment, nor to be extinguished from moment to moment. Thus one is to conform to the essential nature of reality, or dharmata, through this practice of cessation. And it is not that he should first meditate on the objects of the sense in the external world and then negate them with his mind, the mind that has meditated on them. If the mind wanders away, it should be brought back and fixed in correct thought. It should be understood that this correct thought is the thought that whatever is, is mind only, and that there is no external world of objects as conceived. Even this mind is devoid of any marks of its own, which would indicate its substantiality, and therefore is not substantially conceivable as such at any moment. Even if he arises from his sitting position and engages in other activities, such as going, coming, advancing, or standing still, he should, at all times, be mindful of the application of expedient means of perfecting cessation conform to the immobile principle of the essential nature of reality, and observe and examine the resulting experience. When this discipline is well mastered, after a long period of practice, the ideations of his mind will be arrested. Because of this, his power of executing cessation will gradually be intensified and become highly effective so that he will conform himself to and be able to be absorbed into the concentration or samadhi of suchness. Then his defilements, deep though they may be, will be suppressed and his faith strengthened. He will quickly attain the state in which there will be no retrogression. But those who are skeptical who lack faith, who speak ill of the teaching of the Buddha, who have committed grave sins, who are hindered by their evil karma, or who are arrogant or indolent, are to be excluded. These people are incapable of being absorbed into the samadhi of suchness. Next, as a result of this samadhi, a person realizes the oneness of the world of reality, or dharmadhatu, that is, the sameness everywhere and non-duality of the Dharmakaya of all the Buddhas and the bodies of sentient beings. This is called the Samadhi of One Movement. It should be understood that the Samadhi of Suchness is the foundation of all other Samadhis. If a person keeps practicing it, then he will gradually be able to develop countless other kinds of Samadhis. If there is a person who lacks the capacity for goodness, he will be confused by the evil tempter, by heretics, and by demons. Sometimes these beings will appear in dreadful forms while he is sitting in meditation, and at other times they will manifest themselves in the shapes of handsome men and women. In such a case, he should meditate on the principle of mind only, and then these objects will vanish and will not trouble him any longer. Sometimes they may appear as the images of heavenly beings or bodhisattvas, and assume also the figure of the Tathagata, furnished with all the major and minor marks. Or they may expound the spells or preach charity, the precepts, patience, zeal, meditation, and wisdom. Or they may discourse on how the true nirvana is the state of universal emptiness of the non-existence of characteristics, vows, hatreds, affections, causes and effects, and of absolute nothingness. 
They may also teach him the knowledge of his own past and future states of existence, the method of reading other people's minds, and perfect mastery of speech, causing him to be covetous and attached to worldly fame and profit. Or they may cause him to be frequently moved to joy and anger, and thus to have unsteadiness of character, being at times very kind-hearted, very drowsy, very ill or lazy-minded, or at other times becoming suddenly zealous and then afterward lapsing into negligence, or developing a lack of faith, a great deal of doubt, and a great deal of anxiety, or abandoning his fundamental excellent practices toward religious perfection and devoting himself to miscellaneous religious acts, or being attached to worldly affairs which involve him in many ways, or sometimes they may cause him to experience a certain semblance of various kinds of samadhis which are all the attainments of heretics and are not the true samadhi or sometimes they may cause him to remain in samadhi for one two three or up to seven days feeling comfort in his body and joy in his mind being neither hungry nor thirsty partaking of natural fragrant and delicious drinks and foods which induce him to increase his attachment to them or at other times they may cause him to eat without any restraint now a great deal now only a little so that the color of his face changes accordingly. For these reasons, he who practices cessation should be discreet and observant, lest his mind fall into the net of evil doctrine. He should be diligent in abiding in correct thought, neither grasping nor attaching himself to anything. If he does so, he will be able to keep himself far away from the hindrance of these evil influences. He should know that the samadhis of the heretics are not free from perverse views, craving, and arrogance, for the heretics are covetously attached to fame, profit, and the respect of the world. The samadhi of suchness is the samadhi in which one is not arrested by the activity of viewing a subject nor by the experiencing of objects in the midst of meditation. Even after concentration, one will be neither indolent nor arrogant, and one's defilements will gradually decrease. There has never been a case in which an ordinary person, without having practiced this samadhi, was still able to join the group that is entitled to become Tathagatas. Those who practice the various types of dhyana meditation and samadhi that are popular in the world will develop much attachment to their flavors and will be bound to the triple world because of their perverse view that Atman is real. They are therefore the same as heretics, for they depart from the protection of their good spiritual friends. They turn to heretical views. Next, he who practices this samadhi diligently and wholeheartedly will gain ten kinds of advantages in this life. First, he will always be protected by the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the ten directions. Second, he will not be frightened by the evil tempter and his evil demons. Third, he will not be deluded or confused by the ninety-five kinds of heretics and wicked spirits. Fourth, he will keep himself far away from slanders of the profound teaching of the Buddha, and will gradually diminish hindrances derived from grave sins. Fifth, he will destroy all doubts and wrong views on enlightenment. Sixth, his faith in the realm of the Tathagata will grow. Seventh, he will be free from sorrow and remorse, and in the midst of samsara will be full of vigor and undaunted. Eighth, having a gentle heart and forsaking arrogance, he will not be vexed by others. Ninth, even if he has not yet experienced samadhi, he will be able to decrease his defilements in all places and at all times, and he will not take pleasure in the world. Tenth, if he experiences samadhi, he will not be startled by any sound from without. Now, if he practices cessation only, then his mind will be sunk 
in self-complacency, and he will be slothful. He will not delight in performing good acts, but will keep himself far away from the exercise of great compassion. It is, therefore, necessary to practice clear observation as well.